the Bible, the little, small, very good, full, prophetic book of Jude. And um, it's only one chapter, so we'll look at verse 22. Jude and verse 22 this morning. Uh, I've been had this on my heart the last few days, and I'd like to bring a message on this subject. Don't forget now, next Sunday night, our big back-to-school youth rally service. Six o'clock, kids bring on. We're going to have special guests. We're going to have some testimonies, singing, and then a real special back-to-school presentation. That'll be next Sunday night, six o'clock. I want to say also, uh, many of you just come in for, for the preaching service. We're really glad that you're here. Let me encourage you, come to Sunday school. Sunday school. You missed a tremendous blessing this morning. Brother Mike brought that lesson on water and fire and everything else, and you missed a lot. Don't stay in the bed. Get up and come to Sunday school next Sunday morning. All right, Jude, verse number 22. And of some have compassion, making a difference. And of some have compassion, making a difference. A difference. I want to preach this morning on the subject, compassion makes a difference. I want to preach on that word for a little while today, compassion. We're really short on that in most churches that I know anything about. The definition of compassion is being sympathetic, pity, or concern for another's misfortune. In other words, it's feeling when somebody's going through a hard time. My mom, I quote her a lot. You hear me quote my mother almost every Sunday. She had such an influence on my life, but I'll never forget, it didn't matter who got in trouble or who had problems or who it was from the president right on down to a man laying in the ditch. Mom always said, I feel sorry for them. I feel sorry for them. And I'll never forget that. She felt sorry for everybody. And compassion, that's what compassion is. Feeling concern for another person's misfortune. Not just feeling it, but enough to do something about it. Uh, I tried to figure out that word, compass, compass like a compass around, get around something. Or you could put just come and then passion. Uh, you know, it would be a feeling, a care, or a burden. A bunch of scriptures, but I'll just give you a few. Zechariah 7, verse 9. The Bible said that God showed mercy and compassion and was to do it every man to his brother. You're not supposed to be hard and cold to people. You're supposed to have pity and help other people. Lamentations 3 and verse 22. It's, but we're not consumed because his compassions fail not. Matthew 9, 36, the Bible said Jesus was moved with compassion for the multitude. And Psalm 78, verse 38, the Bible said he, the Lord, being full of compassion, would forgive their iniquity. Matthew 20 and verse 34, Jesus had compassion on them. Luke 7 and verse 13, the Bible said when he saw that woman, it said he saw her and had compassion on her. Uh, most churches today are short on compassion. No visitation, no, no missionaries, no knocking on doors, trying to help people, no giving to help the uh, people who really need it, just a big religious show. As somebody said, we're feasting when we ought to be fasting, we're playing when we ought to be praying, and we're growing in grease instead of growing in grace, and that's a good picture of the average so-called uh, Bible church today. I want to talk about compassion this morning, and uh, I want you to listen, give me really, really close attention for just a few minutes. Compassion has nothing to do with your education, has nothing to do with your background or your uh, financial ability. Compassion is caring about somebody else. That's what it is, feeling, feeling for people. Now, the Bible said in the last days, because iniquity would abound, the love of many 
would wax cold. You know what that means? That means the Lord said there's going to be so much sin when the last days come that people will just whack, they just don't quit caring. You just quit caring because of sin. That's what sin does. It dulls your ability to care about somebody else. And if I've heard this once, I've heard it 50 times. Somebody be out here in the ditch, on drugs, in jail, all that. And I've heard Christian people over and over and over say, well, they got their self in that mess. Let them worry about it. And, and that is true. That is true. They many times did get their self in that mess, but that should not stop us from caring and, and feeling for people who need help and need to be pitied. Uh, we get criticized a lot of times for helping families where the dad's on drugs or the mama's on drugs or something like that. And sometimes you say, you're not going to help them, are you? Well, it, it ain't the kid's fault and the kids are having to do without and sometimes you show compassion. And so let me, let me divide this up into a couple of thoughts this morning and uh, give you what I believe the Lord gave me. Number one, we ought to have compassion on each other in the memories, members of our family. To our husband, to our wife, to our children, to our parents. You ought to feel for their misfortune. If somebody in your family is, is going through a hard time, you should feel compassion for them. Now, I know that's hard to do sometimes. Sometimes if it's your kids, you want to kill them. Sometimes if it's your parent, you, you, want, you want to kill them instead of have compassion on them. But the Bible said they were to care. Like wives and husbands. The Bible said that a wife should submit to her husband, be concerned for her husband. If your husband's having problems, you as a wife should have compassion on him. If he's trying, if he's trying, have compassion on him. If, you, if your wife is having a hard time, have compassion on her. What does compassion mean? Compassion means sympathy. It means pity. Ladies, don't sometimes you have to just feel pity for him. Hey, man, say, Lord, have mercy, the poor crazy thing. Hey, he ain't coming out of the rain if it wasn't for me. I, that's right, you're supposed to feel pity for him. Husbands, don't you sometimes feel like, look, I've been doing this a long time. And uh, I've been counseling people. I had marriage counseling right there in that office yesterday where the couple had been married six years. I mean, I hear it all the time. He don't understand me. She don't understand me. If she understood me, it'd be like, if he understood me, that means if, if he agreed with everything I said, we'd be all right. And if he, she agreed with everything I said, we'd be all right. I mean, I've heard it up one side and down the other. I hear it all the time. And you know what I figured out? I figured out that you ain't never gonna figure it out. <laughs> I figured out that men can't understand women and women can't understand men. You know why? We're different. God made us different. So this man wrote a book and he wrote this book and he said, what men know about women, and you open it up and it's just blank pages all the way through it. About time you think you got one figured out. That's he'll fool you, I guarantee you that. And, and it's okay. It's supposed to be like that. Amen? I mean, I've never understood the difference. I don't, I don't understand how a woman thinks. I, honestly, I don't. I, I get it. I get what they're saying. But to us, we can't even imagine how you ladies think, how you feel, and you can't us. God made us different. God made us different. Uh, example after example after example after example. If, uh, if, if Jimmy come in here this morning and he had on a white jacket like this this morning, it would not bother me one bit. I'd say, good job, dude. Uh, you're looking sharp. Uh, you know, like that, you know, if, if he had on the same kind of shoes I got on. But you know what a woman will do? I've seen women almost turn around and go get in their car and leave because another woman had on the same dress. That I mean, I think, to me, that makes no sense. None. I mean, five men in here could have the exact same tie on. It does not, I couldn't care less. I couldn't tell, I, it don't bother me. I mean, then when he says, well, she knows, she knew that I had that and she went over to Belts and got her one just like that. And just go all to pieces over it. Now, if you can explain that to me, write me a book and explain that. I've seen girls at camp all my life, teenage girls. I've seen them up, and one of them say, uh, I, I gotta go to the bathroom. Will you go with me? And here goes two or three of them running out. One of them has to go. Two go for whatever I have no idea. 
listen. If Jimmy come up to me and said, Brother Danny, I got to go to the bathroom. Will you go with me? I'm going to knock you out. We don't think like that. No, I don't want to go to the bathroom. And you ain't going with me neither. Listen, I've seen it. I've seen women. If I've seen this once, I've seen it 50, 100 times. A woman will walk in the church and another lady will punch another lady and say, she is so pretty. And ain't a woman in here that has a problem with that. You say, well, what's weird about that? I'll tell you what's weird about it. If Jason walked up and Jimmy punched me and said, he is so cute. <laughs> That's weird. You tell me there ain't no difference in men and women? You're in the wrong generation, buddy. Our generation is saying, oh, there's no difference, oh, there's no difference. There's a lot of difference. God made us different. And you know what we're supposed to do? Have pity on each other. Poor dumb thing, he can't figure it out. Help him. The, the poor girl, she don't know what to do. Help her. We're to have compassion on each other. Say amen right there. That's right. I'm telling you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we are our kids, kids the same way. Uh, kids, have compassion on your kids. The best book ever written. Are you listening? The best book ever wrote on raising kids is that book right there. There is no book in the world better on raising kids than us. Sometimes you just got to feel for them. Bless their heart. Uh, they're, trying, they're a human being. They're a failure. They're, they have, they're maybe, maybe didn't make good grades or maybe uh, done something bad in school or something like that. Sometimes compassion goes a long way. You don't have to be Mr. Macho and Mr. Tough and be mean to them all the time. They need compassion. They need help. They need uh, you caring about them. They need... Uh, Sometimes they do need discipline. Every, every time, well, I had kids at Bible school this week, and I ain't got nobody in mind when I say this, so if it fits you, all I can say, if, if a shoe fits you, put it on. I, I had kids this week, uh, say, we were talking about spanking them or something like that, and kids told me, said, my mama don't believe in spanking. And I, I hear that all the time. My mama don't believe in spanking this kid. And every time, you know what I want to say? I want to say, your mama ain't been reading her Bible much, has she? Any woman who does not believe in spanking children has not been reading her Bible or if she has, she wasn't paying attention and if she was, she's deliberately disobeying it. Spanking with a rod of correction is scriptural. It's, I, know, I know our generation. I get it. I understand. But our generation's crazy. Let me ask you something. Is what we're doing in this generation working? Lord, no, it ain't. We're raising a bunch of hellions that's going to ruin this country one day when they get their chance at it. I'm telling you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, you know how to, you want me to tell you how to deal with your kids? Look at how God deals with you. God chastens his children. If I get out of line, the Lord spanks me, but he's merciful to me. He has compassion on me. He don't just knock my head off every time I do a little something wrong. As a, as a matter of fact, sometimes you'll do something wrong and you'll think, the Lord's gonna get me, the Lord's gonna get me, and he'll bless you. I mean, sometimes that's just how merciful he is. That's how compassionate, and we ought to be glad he's like that. Now, that's the way we do our kids. And, and they say, boy, daddy's gonna get me for this. Sometimes you say, look, let it go. I feel, I feel for you, you're sorry. Forget about it. Let, let's go do something. Heard about this guy, kid, it's his, his uh, birthday. And his daddy had a big birthday party planned for him. And the kid done something really bad. Hit his sister or something. He got in big trouble. And his daddy said, uh, well, we're going to have to deal with this. And he took him, you know, to the proverbial woodshed and uh, gave him a spanking. And the kid said, well, I probably blew all my chances. I ain't going to get no party there. And he said, nope, that's done. That's dealt with. Now come on in the house. We're going to have a party. And gave him the birthday party. That's the way God does with us. I mean, you can sin last week. You get down and say, God, forgive me. You might have to deal with it. He might have to deal with you. And then you come in here Sunday morning and you can say, I am amazed. He'd take the time to fool with somebody like us. You, you look how God deals with you and deal that way with your children. You'll never go wrong like that. Sometimes you just have compassion. Sometimes you just say, look, I know you're having a hard time and I love you. Let's just forget about it. Let's pray. Let's do better. Sometimes you have to look at your wife and say, look, I know you, I know the devil's hit you. Right, let's just do better. Come on. Let's just wipe it clean and do better. Sometimes you have to look at your husband and say, look, I, I know we've been fussing and everything and, and, and you, you hurt my feelings and everything, but let's just have, sometimes compassion will fix stuff that no amount of money 
can fix, that no amount of, of reasoning can fix. Sometimes you argue till you're blue in the face, but just everybody have a little compassion upon each other. It'll be a blessing to you. Amen. Lord have mercy. I seen them some liberal on the news here a while back, and they were on there saying that they now believe that you are not supposed to change a baby's diaper without its permission. That's, a dumb, that's honest to goodness, these people don't need driver's license. Like if a baby fights you and says, leave me alone, everything, you say, okay. Now, first case, what kind of a nut mama can ask a baby, is it all right to change it? What kind of a baby is dumb enough to want to lay in that filth? If I was a baby, I'd say, yes, please, do something with this. Get this off of me. Uh, wouldn't you? I mean, my goodness, people. That's how crazy. They're saying, oh, we should ask the children what they do. And as a result, the children are running the homes, and it's all messed up. Let me tell you what the Bible said. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from them. The Bible said, listen, ladies, listen, men. The Bible said, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. You don't care about him like you're supposed to. Amen? Number two, the way we care for each other. We talk about each other. I think I, think I heard one of the Sunday school teachers mention that a while ago. Talk, talk bad about each other. They say it takes a baby two years to learn how to talk and seven years to learn how to try to keep his mouth shut. We expect mercy from others. Don't you expect compassion when God, when you've done something wrong, then show somebody else compassion when they do that, in Luke chapter 10, there's a great story. And it's the story of the Good Samaritan. And the Bible said this man, he was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And any time you leave Jerusalem, you go down. That's very, very significant. Jerusalem's on a hill, so no matter where you go, you go down. You're going down from the presence of, of the Old Testament God of the temple there. And he's going down, and he went down. And the Bible said he fell among thieves. And these guys come out from behind the bushes and just beat him up and knocked him in the face and kicked him and robbed him. And he's laying there, blood all over him, laying there in the ditch. And the Bible said, this is what happened. A priest came by that way. A priest. That would be in the ministry in that day and time. There are no Old Testament priests nowadays. And a Catholic priest is not a real priest at all. That, like somebody dressed up like they're going trick-or-treating and trying to figure out how they can get you to God or something like that. So the guy, uh, the guy come by here, the priest by, and he looks, he see, now watch me now, you might see you here. He looks there, and right on the side of the interstate, there he lays. And he says, ooh, wonder what he'd done to get himself in a mess like that. If he was smart and great like me, he wouldn't have been in there. And he went on the other side of the road and walk by like this right here. Wouldn't even pass by him. Left him laying there. And then a Levite, that's the tribe of, of, the, of the Jews. I mean, that's the, they had the priesthood, the Levites did. He came by that way. Look, saw that guy laying there in the ditch. Blood all over him. Guts maybe hanging out. Almost half dead, the Bible said. Half dead. Beat him. That's where we get to saying beat him half to death. He was half dead. And he went, ugh. Went over here on the other side and passed by. But the Bible said a certain Samaritan, a certain Samaritan, y'all listen to me this morning? When he looked, he had compassion on him. He said, man, I don't know if you've done anything to get yourself in that mess. I don't know what the problem is. Man, I want to help you. And he got him, fooled with him, bound him up, put oil on his wound, took him to a motel, got him something to eat, got him back, and took care of that guy. Now that right there is what churches are missing nowadays. Ladies and gentlemen, I get it all the time. I mean, somebody asked me this week, they said, Brother Danny, do you pick up hitchhikers? And you don't really see a whole lot of hitchhikers anymore. Used to be all the time. And I picked up every one. I used to pick up every one, every one I've seen uh, uh, years ago. I mean, having kids in the car, I don't advise ladies to do it. I'm just telling you what I do. I'm not telling you to, but I'm telling you, I'd, I'd pick them up. I mean, I'd, I'd have to open the windows. They'd be so drunk. Uh, they, they stunk so bad. And I remember I'd witnessed to them. I took people toward, up to Black 
like mountains or the asphalt and everywhere else. And, I, and, not, and I'm not bragging like I'm some great person. I'm not. But I'm always thinking in the back of my mind, that could be me. That could be my kid. That could be your, my grandkid one of these days. I'm not, and I know there's crazy people out there. And I know you can get yourself killed and you can get yourself shot. I'm not telling you. But, and I'm not saying everybody on the side of the interstate with a sign deserves or needs help. I'm not. But I'm telling you, people, if it wasn't for the grace of God, that might be me and you out there. And it might be before it's over with. You better watch your attitude toward people. You better not look at them like, oh, God, how disgusting. Why don't they go better themselves? And some of them could. Some of them could. But some of them are... Now, let me, let me just say it like this. There's no excuse for a healthy man to starve to death in America. If a man's healthy in this country, he can get him something to do and keep himself from starving to death. I'm not talking about bums that won't work. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people that really need help. That's what I'm talking about. An old man got sick and he held a grudge against somebody for a long time. He said, I'll never forgive him. I'll never forgive him. I'll never forgive him. And he got sick and started dying, getting ready to die. And they said, well, what are you going to do about your buddy? He said, okay, I forgive him. I'm getting ready to die. But if I live, the grudge still holds. He didn't forgive him. He didn't forgive him. Care for others. Some of you will notice some of you people sitting right here this morning would not notice or care if half the people quit church. You'd never even notice it. You walk right in there and don't even look one way or the other. You're, all you think about is yourself, 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 me, me, minister to my needs, help me. You walk in, walk out. You wouldn't care if the bills are paid. You wouldn't care if anybody has help. You wouldn't care if somebody's going through marriage problems. You don't care. And that's a problem you've got. You need to get right with the Lord this morning. Care about other people. I, I worry about people that talk about their self all the time. You have been around somebody that all they, let's just say, let's just say that I got a check for $100 in the mail and run over a dog this week. And I walk in the door and say, guess what? I got $100 in the mail this week, Jenny, and run over a dog. I don't care if you're dying. Uh, guess what? I got $100 in the mail this week, Beverly, and, and I, got, I run over a dog on the way to church. Uh, guess what, Ken? Guess what? I, I got $100 in the mail. I worry about people that all they, they think the whole world revolves around them and their little week that they just got through having. Have you heard about me? I did this. Have you heard about me? I did this. Have you heard about me? I did this. Have you heard about me, me, me. We're living in the self, most selfish generation that the world has ever seen. Why do you think they call it selfies? Why do you think all people do all week is take pictures of their self and spread them out? Look at me. Everybody look at me. If I'm sick, everybody take care of me. If I have a need, everybody wait on me. I'm telling you that's exact opposite of the Christian life. Jesus said, I lay down my life for you. You ought to lay down your life for the brethren. Come, come walk in here next Sunday thinking about somebody besides yourself for a change. You ever thought about that? Have you ever got up and said, Lord, I want to walk in here and see who I can be a blessing to today instead of saying, you, should, you people should appreciate me. I got up and came down here or up here or over here, up down across the mountain or wherever you come from. I got dressed and come to church. Everybody should thank me. That's our attitude. Our attitude ought to be, glory to God, God's been good to me. Let me see who in here I can help. Let me see who in here I can be a blessing to. Let me see. That's what the good Samaritan did. He went to him, saw his wound, bound up his wound. I'm suspicious of people that all they can talk about is their self. There, in Romans 2, 21, it said, Thou that judgest doeth the same thing. I'm suspicious of people that's always talking bad about everybody in the church or out of the church. I'm, I'm suspicious of people like that. It, it's almost like they got some sin they're trying to cover up. I mean, it's always, well, they're not this, and they're not that, and that person's not this, and they're not. You better be careful about putting down somebody. Look around here and say, well, not many people in our church do this. Not many people in our church do this. Not many people in our church do that. Well, let me ask you something. The Bible said, thou that judgest doest the same thing. 
You better be careful about that kind of attitude. You better be careful about, you better care about other people and what they need. You better care about others, not just get wrapped up in yourself all the time. And by the way, listen, by the way, God, we're all the same. There ain't nobody in here no different than nobody else. There ain't nobody in here no better than nobody else. There are churches where you have to make a certain income bracket to quote, be in that in the in group in that church. Thousands of them. There are churches where you have to drive a certain make or valued automobile to be a, anybody in that church. That ain't what a church is. A church should never be everybody's in the same income bracket. I don't know what that is, but it ain't a church. In a church, there ought to be a rich woman sitting right here with a diamond that big, with a brand new Cadillac sitting outside, weeping, asking God to speak to her, and right beside her, a bus kid, rub a booger on that big diamond ring. That's a real church. I ain't kidding. I mean that. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. A church, the ground is level, people, at the foot of the cross in here this morning. People talk about this and, and, and judging and racism and, and all of that stuff. And, and let me just say, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure I don't need to here, but I'm, I'm sure you understand that. There, there is no place for that in a Christian's life. You ain't no better than nobody else. There's three races of people in this world, basically, black, brown, white. They come from Noah's three boys, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. One went to Europe, one went to Asia, one went to Africa. It's easy traced in the Bible. There ain't nothing to it. And there's nobody in this world any better than anybody. If you don't like somebody just because their skin is different color than yours, you're not right with God where you need to be. And both it goes both ways. Brown, black, white. By the way, they ain't none of us pure or nothing. I don't reckon we're a mixture of some of the three about everybody in here. So quit, quit. quit. You, know, you say, well, I don't like them. They don't look like me. Listen, they're a person. They're a human. Jesus died. Somehow or another, we get the idea that all these little starving kids in this country, well, they're not really important as we are. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. God loves every one of them. Listen, if it's our kids, if it's our kids over there in Africa having to beat rocks all day just to eat, oh, Lord, we'd get the government, we'd raise money, we'd don't. Listen, have compassion on everybody, bus workers. Care about them people. Don't ever write nobody off. It worries me, y'all. Let's have compassion on people. Compassion on people. People that are homeless. People that are homeless. There's people here, probably here this morning. Don't even know where you're going to sleep tonight. And I get it, I get it. You say, well, Brother Danny, I've helped people and they've burnt me. I have too. I have too. But if you help somebody and they burn you or take advantage of you, God will bless you the same as if they didn't. And just because you've been burnt time or two don't mean you shouldn't help people. Now, if, if I know somebody's on drugs and they say, give me money, and I say, why? And they say, I'm starving. I ain't ate all day. I say, well, come here. I'll take you over here to the store and buy you, buy you a hamburger. And most of the time they'll say no. I say, well, you said you was hungry. And then they get mad and walk off. That, you, don't, you don't have to worry about that. If somebody's just trying to uh, take advantage of you to get your money, you don't worry about that. I'm talking about just walking in with your nose stuck up in the air like you're the only person in the world when the whole world around us is, is suffering and dying and going to hell without God. That's why we run the buses. You know why I run them buses? Because I can't stand the thoughts of kids out here going to bed and know, not knowing who Jesus is and not, not knowing who the Lord is. I can't stand that. I can't stand it. I, I think, I know like mom, I feel sorry for them. My cousin, Linda Gale, y'all, some of y'all know Linda Gale, my cousin up in West Virginia, she's, she's got a heart big as this pool pit. And she'd, she's got a lot, a big, big, big heart. And her husband, he's made a lot of money and, and they're fairly well off and done well. And coal, he has coal trucks. He's running a hundred and something coal tandem trucks.
for years, and the Democrats about ruined it, and it's coming back a little bit now, thank God. But she told me, I talked to her the other day, the Citrons was coming through West Virginia, and they was going to Kermit to see that old Fanny, uh, I can't remember her last name, Fanny Spaulding. If you've never heard Fanny Spaulding sing, Gaithers and all them can't touch it with a 30-foot pole. She's an old woman that lives up in Marbone Creek. That's in Kermit, West Virginia, where my family lives. She's 90, 95 or something like that. Look her up and listen to her sing. Make cold chills. And they drove all the way to Kermit to see Fanny Spaulding. And I, I told them, I said, you need to go see my cousin while you're there. And I told them, and man, they, they loved it. She put out a big, made them sandwiches, you know, to Kermit. And she told me, she said, Danny, Danny, that's what they call me. She said, Danny, me and these ladies at the church said, we fix 60 bags of food every week, and on Friday, we give them to these kids. Did you know now that there's kids, especially up in there in them mountains, almost every one of them, their family's on drugs. And those kids go from Friday to Monday a lot of times with nothing to eat. That's hard for you all to believe. It's the truth. She said, we fix them a bag of food and take it to them every week. And so they give out food in the schools. They're doing that here now because there's so many people on drugs. And I'm, it's easy to get hard to stuff like that, y'all. It's easy to think, well, good night. It ain't my fault. And, it, and it's not our fault. And, but it's not them kids' fault. It ain't their fault. And she said, we, feed, we give them 60 bags of food a week. And she said, one little boy went to his teacher the other day and said, where's my food? She said, we didn't get it today. And he started crying. Little boy. I mean, they people living in school buses. And mama passed out. And daddy, who knows where. And churches on every corner. They said that 95% of Christians never win one soul to the Lord Jesus Christ. We build beautiful buildings. Nothing wrong with a nice building. I'm glad we got one. Thank God we've given us a good place to worship. Thank God he's been good to us. But you know, Lord have mercy, y'all. I've seen people in churches when a sinner comes into church not dressed right or maybe smell like alcohol or something, I've seen people stare at them and look like, what are you doing in here? Lord have mercy, that ain't the way a church is supposed to be. That ain't the way a church is supposed to be. You can't fuss at a blind man because he can't see. Now you can fuss at him if he refuses to take the treatment. But not because he can't see. I'll say this and I'm through. Our words don't impress people, but our scars and our tears do. They don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. You say, well, Brother Danny, it's been a long time since I cried. You know what you need to do? You need to ask the Lord to soften up your heart. If it's been, if you ain't cried in the last six months, not even one tear, you need to ask the Lord to soften your heart. You're getting hard. And the longer you go without it, I mean, something ought, to, something ought to break your heart once in a while. Ought to weep. If they're going to burn forever, if they're going to stay in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, I mean, 10,000 years, 100,000 years, a million years, a billion years, Lord have mercy, it wouldn't hurt us to give out a tract to them. Gosh, people. Never forget old John Harper. I told you this story before, and I'll tell you that, and I'm through. He was an old preacher, somehow on the Titanic, on its maiden voyage when it went down. And they said when that Titanic started going down, it wasn't like the movie, you know. It was all, you wasn't sitting there in a nice comfortable chair eating popcorn and watching the love story. That wasn't the way that thing really was. It was screaming and cussing and crying out and people falling in them icy cold waters. Buddy, I'm telling you, they, they said that people, people would leave a, a box full of gold and money and picked up two or three oranges to try to eat on them lifeboats and stuff. That's all, the, that's all that meant anything to them right then. And they said one, they, they all got down in that water and, and some of them would just grab a hold of something, 
about as big as this guitar case right here and float around on it one time. And John Harper was a preacher. And he said, this man, the man floated over these waves, you know, and everything. And John Harper, everybody's holding on for dear life. Some screaming, some the boat, you know, it broke or whatever it did and went down like that. And he said, man, is your soul saved? And that guy said, I fear it is not. And John Harper looked back at him and said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And they said, waves come between them. A few minutes, the waves brought him back. There that guy was again. And John Harper, the old preacher, said, Hey, man, is your soul saved? He said, I fear it is not. He said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And they said, That guy, John Harper, went down. He drowned. And the last thing he ever done was told somebody about the Lord, and they got saved. And that guy stood up and gave a testimony in a church not long after that. And he said, I'm John Harper's last convert. And that old boy going down to his grave was trying to help somebody else get saved. That's what we ought to do. It ought to be not about us. I remember mom, when she was laying there suffering, bad. I'd walk in there. She didn't say, boy, y'all really don't care much about me. You know what she'd say? She'd say, son, you've got too much to do to come up here. You know what that is? That's somebody that's always thinking about other people, not their self. Some have compassion making a difference. I believe it. in this old world, it's hard, y'all. I, I mean, I deal with the same stuff y'all do. You try to help 15 drug addicts and 14 and a half of them messes up. We got a call this morning. Why we been here at church? Kelly, take me back there. DSS called this morning wanting us to take a seven-month-old baby. You said, what, what do you think we'll do? <laughs> We're going to talk about it after a while. I mean, you can't say no. I mean, what can you say? No, we got plans. Us. I mean, what kind of people are we? We're going to have to kick out a few first. I'm just kidding. But just, just helping people. Just helping people. You say, I don't know nobody I can help. You know what? You know, I'm going to tell you why you don't. Because all you see is yourself and your problem and your little wants and your little needs and your little desire. Get your mind off yourself for about 15 minutes. Put it on your church. Your church needs you. The Lord needs you. And let's have compassion making a difference. All right, let's stand by here for prayer. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Have compassion on your husband. Have compassion on your wife. Have compassion on your children. Have compassion on your parents. They're not perfect. She's playing softly. Have compassion on other people, people you work with, people that are having problems. Forgive, forgive, forgive. Settle it. Have compassion on the lost. Let's get in this altar this morning and say, Lord, they don't care how much we know till they know how much we care. Come on, come on, just meet me here in the altar this morning. Amen. Let's just pray this morning. Let's ask God to help us and give us a heart of compassion for bus kids the bus ministry for people that are hungry cold starving mission field help us Lord we pray right now in Jesus name Amen have thine Amen. own way come on come on this morning let's, let's do business with God have right here this thine own way. let's do business with the Lord come on right now Amen thou art the potter I am the, the clay. clay everybody sing it now holy After thy will, Amen. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Everybody, say it now. Have thine own way. Say it now. Lord, have thine own way. Amen. Search me and try me, Master, today. Come on now. Wider than snow, Lord, wash me just.
just now as in the presence humbly I bow. He's praying this morning. One of the verses that me and you need to really worry about in our generation is because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold. There's just so much sin all around you just get numb to it. You get to where it don't affect you. It don't bother you. Years ago, if you saw somebody needing help, it tore you up. Now you don't even care. You know why? You get burnt. You get burnt. They take advantage of you. You know, you see them out there, money for the blind, and then you see them, when they get your money, we'll go into the movies. I mean, that happens. It does. But if you if you help, I tell you, I tell you how you'll never get burnt. Get you a handful of tracks. And give them to everybody you can think of. Amen. And tell them the greatest story ever told. Amen. Amen. Have compassion, making a difference. Maybe there's somebody in your life, maybe a cousin, a nephew. I'm tired of fooling with them. I ain't never trying to help them again. I've tried and tried. That, and, and I don't really blame you. For, sometimes you get like that. We all do. But maybe sometimes you ought to just say, hey, you know what? I love you. And I'm willing to pray with you willing to encourage you. Don't give up on nobody. Don't give up on nobody. God didn't give up on us. We don't want to give up on them. All right. Amen. All right.